Uh, we've discussed now the history and the theology of Islam. I'd like to talk a little bit about law and how uh, Islam interacts with, uh, creates its own religious law, but how that uh, interacts with law that is made by other uh, entities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so let's start with the topic that has actually become, strangely in some ways, uh, right. very controversial in the United States, and that's the issue of Sharia right. law. Uh, what is the Sharia? What does that mm -hmm. mean? Mm -hmm. Well, what it what does not mean these days anything about Islam? First, you have to explain what it is not before you explain what it is. Right. It does not mean a frozen set of uh, theocratic rules established in the Quran or by Muhammad 1,400 years ago, where all Muslims are mandated and to abide by. It's really it's really fun uh, fun to even think. It challenges my trust to common sense and human intelligence that people could believe 1.7 billion people blindly following some frozen rules established 1400 years ago. That's absolutely not the case. Sharia it literally means the path. The path takes you to the water. The path. So in that sense, it's very similar to the Jewish concept of halakha. It's the path that you choose to walk towards God. It's the path that informs your life and every aspect of your life. Islam, for many believing practicing Muslims, if not all Muslims, it's not a religion. It's a way of life. It informs every aspect of your life. Islam has principles and suggestions how you get in and out of the bathroom, what you say after you basically discharge yourself, how you eat, how you conduct your marriage, how do you conduct your business, etc. There is really no sort of uh, secular and religious spaces clearly distinguished from one another uh, in, in Islamic understanding. So it, Sharia means a web of moral, ethical understanding of how to be an ethical, moral people. How can you live your life in such a way that every action you take will bring you a step closer to God Almighty? So in Islam, there is a, there is a very unique and un, uh, not Western experience between church and state. In so many ways, what happened in 325 to Christianity when Constantine converted to uh, Christianity, Christianity became the state religion. Um, in so many ways, that happened to Islam 20 years ago. And in so many ways, it never happened to Islam. The officialdom, the officialdom, the state religion relationship always have been independent. Uh, uh, the only theocracy we had in the history of Islam is Muhammad until 1979, the Iranian revolution. Right. We have never had in the history of Islam a uh, people or group of people who hold the religious power and the political power at the same time. What was the caliph then during the uh, Ottoman Empire? Explain that. It was, a, it was a political figure. It was a much more symbolic figure. He had no authority to dictate doctrines. He was in no way comparable to Pope in Vatican. Like he couldn't dictate people what to believe. If you look at the both Sunni and Shia tradition, the eponyms and the founders of the schools of thought who informed the Sharia in the Sunni tradition and the Shia tradition, all the founding fathers were not government civil servants. They were not kings. They were not khalifs. They have never been employed by the government. They, some of them have been imprisoned by the government because they were opposing the government. So very early on, Muslims understood that power corrupts religion. So they wanted to, um, they wanted to develop the theological aspect of Islam. That has never been in the history of Islam. Uh, the king or an emperor sitting in the councils uh, telling people what will be canonized, what will not be keeping, what will be kept out of the canon, or what will be, be the creed of Islam. There was, it was always in the, in the hands of civilians. The religious scholars were always independent from the government. There was no sort of a theocracy, theocratical understanding of merging religion with the political authority whatsoever. Coming back to Sharia though, it's a very, but I, I challenge everybody. If you think Sharia is a blueprint, full set of rules and regulations, show me one Sharia book, one blueprint book. It doesn't exist. It's a, Sharia is a oceans of literature, oceans of negotiations and conversations, oceans of opinions and religious rulings of thousands of men and women who took that six creed and five pillars. And how do you bring this to your life? How do you manifest itself in the human experience? And in its interpretation, there are so many, so many disagreements. I'll just give you an example. In, sure. the, in the fifth century of Islam, Muslim scholars, they came together. It's been 500 years, Muslims are now very strong, and there has been so much. They said, we have to put this together. We have to assess and digest the last 500 years of Islam. And they wrote a book, what are the things all Muslims agreed, all consensus, 
we have absolutely consensus, a collective uh, understanding of one thing. They wrote a book, all these things that they have, they have agreed. That book is about 40 pages. Hmm. And then they said, um, what are the issues and areas that Muslims disagreed? There's a difference of opinion. And they wrote volumes after volumes. That book is still, we are writing. It's thousands of pages. So Sharia is an open ocean of negotiation. Uh, as many modern challenges come into Muslim life, how do you, how do you live according to the will of God um, as you try to understand throughout the teachings of the Quran and the example of the Prophet Muhammad? If I can put again a few numbers, it's always helpful for 21st century positivist thinking. Today, what we consider that this bulk of oceans of literature of Sharia uh, is about 70% of that is uh, basically regulating your devotional life, your personal life between you and God. There is no ordained clergy in Islam. There is no church in Islam. You don't have to go to a mosque to pray. It's very individualistic. You can connect to God wherever you are. Uh, so 70% of the Sharia conversation and literature we have today is how to pray, how to fast, what kind of water to use for your ritual bath, and etc. And about maybe 20% of the Sharia is basically your family law as you, as you today your inheritance, your relationship with your spouses, how to conduct marriage, how to initiate uh, divorce, etc. It's, it's, it's the family law. And about maybe 7-8% of it relates to uh, government. Uh, and if you ask me, the crucial question is, what part of Sharia is mutable? What part of Sharia is changeable? What part of Sharia is basically endorsed by God and cannot be touched? And what part of it is? Uh, except certain ritualistic, like Muslims will pray five times a day. It will not be four, it will not be six. We will fast in the month of Ramadan. We will pray on Friday, not Wednesday. I don't think these are immutable. Uh, I think these are established, canonized, ritualistic practices of Islam that it will not change. But other than that, personal devotions, things related to family law, things related to uh, governmental issues, political issues, government structure, as you will see in the last 14 years, as it has changed, as there is a vast, diverse opinion of, on all matters, it, has, it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is changeable, it is mutable, it is uh, possible to change those penalties. And today, these people uh, who cut off hands and who basically... I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Things like uh, people say, well, these blasphemy laws right. in Pakistan, where if you say anything critical of Islam at all, you can be thrown in jail. Right. You can have very harsh punishments, things like honor killings. People will say that this is part of the Sharia. It's part of mm -hmm. Islamic practice. It's mandated mm -hmm. by the Quran. It, that's not true? It would be dishonest to say those practices have nothing to do with Sharia. It would not be true. It, they have something to do with Sharia, but it has it has nothing to do with the spirit of Sharia whatsoever. What you see in those deeply broken societies, economically, socially, culturally failed societies, who just got out of their colonial powers, completely lost their accumulated knowledge and wisdom uh, in Sharia and in the religious studies, going back and trying to make sense of the practices 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 500 and 600 years ago. So if you look at any Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Iran, the laws that governing those countries are mixed of Islamic law, British law, French law, local tribal law. It's not one thing. It's the combination of, like, especially the blasphemy law in Pakistan was established during the British colonial time. And it has a lot to do with the British uh, way of dealing with uh, minorities. And if you look at it, it's not purely Islamic as well. There's a whole scale of confusion and perversion and distortion of misunderstanding of Sharia. Uh, basically, the mechanisms when in good days, when the Sharia was working, when it was responding to people's needs, when there are some new challenges, we were able to change those laws. Basically, you see in terms of blasphemy or stoning to death or chopping the hands, the things which worked as a deterrent, deterrent 600 years ago, there are some crazy dictators using religion for all sorts of different reasons, taking that 600 years old practice, which has never been practiced in between, and trying to bring it and imply it. It would be like a Jewish uh, dictator, a tyrant, bringing the temple laws into 21st century and forcefully trying to impose them and implying them. So uh, are you saying then that some of these practices are a, a Sharia reasoning process might have produced them? Right. 
and uh, in, in some ways a valid Sharia process. However, the those who made those interpretations really, in your view at least, made uh, serious errors in their reasoning. Exactly. And therefore, they have no place in Sharia. Because Sharia, maqasa the Sharia, the, re, the, the purposes of Sharia, has to do five or six things depending on... It has to protect intellect. It has to protect freedom of speech. It has to protect people's ability to live a life. It has to protect people's ability to practice their religion. The, Anything you produce in Sharia, it has, to, it has to be in line with those centrally established Quranic principles. It's the opposite. It's destroying the country. It's destroying people. It's destroying freedom of speech, people's ability to practice own religion. It, so in, in, in a taking, uh, because all propaganda, all uh, basically distorted ideology cannot be outflat lie. They are based on half-truth. They are based on partial truth. Yeah, these issues and practices have partial connection to Sharia, but in their understanding and implementation today, they are, com they are in complete contradiction, if not violation of the spirit of Sharia. Let's talk about one, an, uh, uh, another sensitive issue, but it relates to the Sharia. Mm -hmm. Some critics of Islam say that, you know, the oneness, the, the, the idea of submission mm -hmm. means that uh, Muslims must submit entirely to only Sharia law, mm -hmm. and if there's a conflict between Sharia law and the civilian laws, right. uh, non-religious laws passed by whether it's the United States Congress or uh, Parliament right. or even in a, a non-democratic state, that uh, the people's religious obligations trump uh, uh, their mm -hmm. uh, ones as citizens. And uh, that leads to, a, in some ways, a conflict between the notion of, of, of being a good Muslim yeah. and uh, being a citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what would you say to that? I am not dismissing uh, people's legitimate um, concerns and people's legitimate fears in that sense. I mean, there are crazy people out there who actually are like that. There are insane people like Al-Qaeda, like Taliban, like people in Iran and Saudi Arabia who actually believe a very... Do you mean mentally ill when you say insane or just that they have very distorted views? They have very distorted views and I don't think they are mentally healthy. I can, I think as a chaplain I have, I have authority to say that. Uh, because their actions do not necessarily show a healthy individual's behavior, a set of behaviors. So there are people, but um, it's a whole one thing, like how representative they are, how informed they are in religious studies and uh, how much they represent the entirety of the Islamic history, Islamic theology, it's, it's all one thing. But if you, uh, the whole premise of Muslims are uh, mandated to follow Sharia and submit themselves to Sharia, that's absolutely not true. That's absolutely not true. An overwhelming majority of Muslims would even laugh at this idea. We are all uh, mandated to submit ourselves to God Almighty alone, not the law itself. The principles that Sharia advises, wherever they are, wherever they are, we are there to welcome and appreciate them. Many American Muslims came to the United States because the United States is much more Sharia compliant than Egypt, than Saudi Arabia, than Iran, than Turkey. Because the secular democracy and the civic society that we have, the healthy functioning society, is basically much more Sharia compliant. Sharia in line with the teachings of Sharia or understanding of Sharia than many of the Muslim majority countries. There are some studies actually. When people take the principles of Sharia and apply to countries which Sharia, which, country, which countries are the most Sharia compliant, all the Scandinavian countries with cer certain strong social justice uh, aspect, they, they come in the top of the list. So uh, are you saying that um if there is a conflict in some ways between, let's say, uh, the notion, uh, Western notion of freedom of speech, right, uh, with the principle that the, the prophet shall not be uh, uh, put in a, a physical, uh, artistic right. representation, um, that um, w that led to the controversy over the cartoons and all. Those are you know, core you know, uh, Western principle and then in, in very much ways a core religious principle. Are they, uh, uh, does a, a Muslim citizen of a, of a Western democracy feel the conflict in that regard? <clears throat> they would, uh, they would personally feel conflict, but according to Sharia, according to Islam, they have absolutely no 
a right to prevent people doing what they do or say what they do. This is not the first time Muslims are living in a minority situation. Chinese Muslims are living as minority for the last 1400 years. In India, in, in certain parts of Europe, Muslims had developed the minority status understanding. If you are in a minority status, if it's not Muslim majority, law of the land supersedes every interpretation of Sharia, except if that law of the land is preventing you practicing your religion. If none of the Western laws are preventing you from praying five times a day or fasting in the month of Ramadan, giving your charity, as long as they give you that protection, so whatever that the law of the land does, it's not your business. The only thing you can do if you are not happy about it, you can just leave. You can just travel. You can just go somewhere else. But if you are happy that you are given your religious freedom and opportunity, and if some of the practices of that society is not in line or in contradiction with what you believe, that's not your business. As simple as that. You have to, you have to obey the law of the land. The law of the land supersedes your own understanding, as long as it's not preventing you from practicing your own religion. And of course, in the United States, the, those protections are enshrined in our Constitution. Yes. Uh, so that would be the, the most comfortable place in some ways for a Muslim because it's really one of the only places in the world where that's enshrined as a constitutional principle. I cannot tell this enough. I am working in one of the most prestigious universities in the United States as a Muslim Imam, as a Muslim chaplain. If I do 10% of what I do in many Muslim countries, I'll be arrested. I'll be arrested, let alone, let alone a Muslim majority country universities are hiring um, Christian chaplains or Jewish chaplains, etc. I will be only proud if they do that. That will be very much in line of the spirit of Sharia. But the, it tells you how this society is beautiful, how it's very much Sharia compliant, how it is very much in line of uh, pluralism and diversity, how honoring everybody's personal choices. Thank you. Welcome.